I think we have this kind of misconception about suffrage and the suffragettes themselves that all women did to get their vote was to march, argue, maybe break a few windows, maybe kind of cause a bit of a ruckus, but the reality is completely different. And I think until now, our cultural memory and definitely everything I was taught in school, and I think you were probably taught in school, was kind of a if Mary, I went. Yeah, <laughs> was kind of that Mary Poppins esque version of suffrage, which is very proud women, but not really doing that much. And the reality is completely different. I mean, if would how, how often do people not believe you when you, when you say when when you say something along the lines of the suffragettes? were possibly the largest homegrown terrorist organisation this country's yeah. ever seen? I, I'm very lucky in that because I've spent my whole history career as a kind of researching my PhD and writing Death in 10 Minutes on looking just at the terrorism of the suffragettes, I have everything. So I get to stand there and when I am talking to people, I'm always standing there with the photographs of the destruction or of the bombs or kind of maps showing the huge scale and scope of the bombing and arson campaign. And the way I talk about this is it's simply common sense history. When you show people the facts and you show people the reality, it's not an argument anymore. It's more just a new thing you now know. And because, because you, you focused on your book, Death yeah. in 10 Minutes, on Kitty Marion. I did. I was, I was kind of incredibly lucky. I was doing my PhD and I was working in the Museum of London Archive, just kind of looking for interesting stories about women and, and what was happening in our world at that time. And there's an amazing curator at the Museum of London called Beverly Cook who knows her archive, which is huge. I mean, this is... It's, it's almost like the Da Vinci Code of kind of women's history and suffrage history. There is so much in there that, that they're still having to catalogue it. You know, it's insane. Wow. And she said, I've got this kind of typed autobiography that a woman has left and no one's ever looked at it. No one's ever really explored it in any detail. And I was like, oh, amazing. Tell, like, tell me more. Yeah. Bring it out. She brought it out. She went, oh, and by the way, she's a suffragette. And at the moment, I kind of, I rolled my eyes because <laughs> I, well, you know, I'd grown up like I think a lot of millennials, because we're supposed to use that term now, had with the, with like you said, the Mary Poppins-esque version of history of suffrage. And I didn't think it was that interesting. I didn't think it was something I connected to as a younger woman. And I didn't want to fall into that trap of being a female historian who only writes about suffrage. There's so much more, you know, our history of women is so much bigger and, and so much more exciting. So I thought, oh, well, I'll sort of, I'll, I'll try it and I'll get through it and I'll, I'll just find interesting little bits. And I sat down and I started reading it and I realised I was never going to stop because this incredible voice just leapt off the page. And I realised in that moment, I knew nothing. I had no idea of this part of our history. And if I knew nothing as someone who was supposed to be writing about women, <laughs> then it's very clear from sort of conversations I then had with friends and family and other historians that we knew nothing about this. Like our collective memory has been completely sanitized and forgotten and removed of one of our most important campaigns. I mean, you, so how old was Kitty Marion, and how, how how did she fall into yeah. how did she fall into the suffragette movement, which started off as something completely different into into what it became further, as we see in the documentary yeah. and, and and also the book. It did. I think I think that's another thing people aren't really aware of. We tend to think that the fight for the vote in sort of nineteen the nineteen tens to nineteen eighteen mm. is is all that the campaign was, and actually the fight for suffrage had started in properly in the eighteen sixties. And they'd been going on for decades. There had been over 16,000 petitions to Parliament <laughs> begging for female suffrage, and none of them had got through. They'd was that all? Sorry, so was yeah. that was that all? Women asking for the petitions? Was there were there, were there alliances between? Were there, were there allies involved? Male allies? Absolutely. I mean, I think I think one of the the issues we have is thinking of this as a woman's only campaign, and it never has been. You know, it was John Stuart Mill who took one of the first bills to Parliament on behalf of women asking for female suffrage back in the 1860s. And when we're looking at kind of the, the bombing and the arson campaigns, mm. there's an amazing woman who's in, um, who's in Death in 10 Minutes called Jenny Baines. 
and she's arrested for a bomb on a train with her husband and her son. And when the police go and raid her home, they find balaclavas and a half-made bomb, a fully made bomb, revolvers, gun, like shotguns loaded, ready for their next attack. And this is a woman who wasn't, you know, she wasn't doing this by herself. She had her whole family with her, supporting her to do these things. And we, we tend to forget that those stories Whenever we talk about women, we just about the suffrage campaign. We just kind of we talk about the Pankhursts, and that's mm. it. And it's so much more than that. And so, how old was Kitty Marion then when she yeah. wrote the when she wrote this well, biography? Well, so Kitty Kitty's life starts in 1871, and she's born in Germany and has kind of a terrible, awful relationship with her father. He's abusive physically, um, abusive not sexually, we don't think, but. Um, beats her and, and constantly kind of emotionally belittles her. He's, all, he's a horrific man. And she goes to stay with her uncle, who obviously realizes what's happening, and makes a choice, which I think is a very difficult choice, but one families often make, is to rescue her. So he sends her, without her father's knowledge, to England to stay, live with her Aunt Dora. And she arrives here at the age of 15, having travelled from Germany, almost kind of on a midnight train, completely alone, not knowing anyone, not speaking any English, mm. kind of rescued from this awful place. And she goes to stay with her aunt in the East End of London. And it just kind of becomes a general dog's body. But she's had this kind of dream in her heart from a very young age, because her mother, who had passed away when she was very young, had been involved in the stage and she's determined that that's the world she wants to be part of and she thinks there's nothing wrong with wanting to be an actress as a woman it's perfectly respectable you know it's how I will how I'll be independent and live my life and do what I want to do um, and she manages to persuade her aunt when she gets to the age of 19 that this will give them an income and it will make it be a right. money earner and a kind of she can do it and she goes and she learns to become a dancer she's a great singer she goes to an agent in York Road just off of Waterloo to get her first job and she's really excited you know kind of like this is this is my moment I've got my agent I can do this and the agent finds her a booking and he says she's going to be wonderful uh, can you come back at 5 p.m. the next day to sign your contract and of course she does, she's young, she's naive. She doesn't put two and two together that at 5 p.m. the office is going to be shut and no one else is going to be there. And he assaults her and knocks her unconscious. And that moment at the age of 19, that kind of first attack, ricochets across her whole life because she realizes she faces a moment of either, either you leave now, you leave this industry, you, 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 know, you become a nun, that's mm. it for your life, or you stay and you fight for change. So for the next 20 years, she stays as an actress, desperately fighting for change. She goes through multiple sexual assaults at the hands of different agents, different managers, trying to convince the government that they should listen to her. And no one does. And just at the moment where she's losing hope and she's in her 40s, the suffragettes appear. I mean, so there's me too. Yeah. And then there's her. Yeah. And that's emblematic of... It's insane that it has taken us a hundred years for actresses once again to finally push for change for our sexual culture. And if you think a hundred years ago, Kitty as an actress, no one would listen. She was facing exactly the same things. She went to the press, she went to the government. No one would listen to her. And a hundred years later, we're finally here again because actresses have really led the charge. And I think, I think that shows us how much how important this history is to us mm. because if we didn't know is it because we didn't know that it's taken us this long i mean what do you think i well, <laughs> i i think yeah i think it is because because our knowledge of this world has been sanitized and forgotten and we should have known this so much earlier this should have been part of our kind of everyday education our everyday life is is what these worlds are like and what women have had to face and how hard they fought for it. Because Kitty doesn't join the suffragettes to argue. She joins the suffragettes because she is done talking. Mm. And they have decided now to commit this huge nationwide arson and bombing campaign in retaliation for kind of the sexual assaults that women are suffering in the workplace and the fact the government won't listen and the huge police brutality that is being conducted on women just marching for their rights. And I think, I think people 
you know, if you're looking at radicalization and how people become radicalized, you see that so clearly in the suffragettes. These are women who start out marching. They, aren't, they don't wake up one day and go, oh, what shall I do? <laughs> I'll leave a bomb somewhere. Yeah. You know, they've started out marching. No one would listen. Then the police, you know, Winston Churchill has sent in mounted police to charge them down, causing horrific injuries. And then they've gone to the bombings and they've been force fed in prison and it's just the mm. most atrocious kind of sort of torture. And then the bombs start. So it really, it really is this kind of period of radicalization for so many women in the movement that the, it's the violence that has done to them that causes them to create violence that we find today exceptionally shocking. That was shocking at the time, but we've never talked about that. I mean, in, in, and exposing what they went through, these women, um, you're, and, and sort of, the, sort of tackling the sanitization, as you, as you say, of, of the yeah. history. You also then bring up another element, which is, you know, um, how people um, perceive historical figures that we are often yeah. told are are great individuals, yeah. and how actually they have been responsible for actions which you will probably, most of the time, not agree with. Yeah, I think. I think for me, because the kind of the history that I, I like to write and the history I think matters is stuff that breaks the mould, stuff that breaks our understanding. Mm -hmm. We think it's one way and actually it's the other. And I believe absolutely that our history must never be a comfort blanket. Kind of the worst thing we can do for ourselves is to make history something that we don't question, that we don't ask further kind of information mm -hmm. of because our history should be there to kind of to teach you something so our idols have to be allowed to be flawed we have to understand that leaders can make terrible decisions as much as they can do fantastic things for us because every choice someone in the past has made whether it's bad or good has got us to where we are today and we have to know that in its whole totality because otherwise otherwise you're just asking to be lied to and I think when you're looking at today, when we are living in the time of fake news mm -hmm. and alternative facts, I mean, you can't, <laughs> you can't say the phrase alternative facts to a historian because either you have a fact or you don't. <laughs> it's either a fact or a lie. Yeah. There's no you know, alternative. A different way of seeing the truth is, is, is completely wrong. And one of the things historians like me get to do is challenge what had been a traditional reality and show you there are other voices, show you that history in the previously has been written by people with one agenda who wanted to only showcase the best of the past. And actually showcasing the hard things helps make our world better. Is that because then we understand that there hasn't always been perfection, that mm -hmm. there hasn't always been a concord between groups but and, 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 and there has been an acceptance of you know a, a utopia a, a, a sort of a fantasy land I think so I think the worst yeah I think that kind of idea of the past as a fantasy land is one of the most dangerous things we can have because then the people who get to decide what that fantasy that shared mm. fantasy is are those in power and they always have one specific agenda so for a really long time our fantasy world has been empire and the past and believing that our history is white only and, and that is one of the most damaging things you can do because it alienates huge sections of our society Britain has always been multicultural. Britain has been multicultural since the Roman period. And I think one of the things that makes me the most angry as a historian is the fact that that is not, that we are having to fight to make that common knowledge. Mm -hmm. And it's because history has been written about only by those who are, have been in power. So they've just written about themselves. But there are amazing books coming out. There are amazing documentaries coming out. We are really shifting, finally, our history now, which to some feels like it's too PC or a shift into a weird world that isn't true. It's not. It's actually just the reality of the past. What we're doing is removing the barriers that people have put into it in previous generations. And, and with, um, um, and with um, Death in 10 Minutes, your mm -hmm. book, and Suffragettes, which is on BBC One, prime yeah. time as well. Yeah. I mean, what kind of pushback have you experienced from 
from people, uh, be, it, be it in publishing or, yeah. or television or people who have watched or read about this history which is being presented, these stories which haven't been told, which haven't, which haven't you know, been given a platform previously. What kind of pushback have you had? Well, I've, I've been incredibly lucky in that I've spent my kind of academic life being in public. So every bit of research I have, I've always fed into TV or drama or radio or into books. And that's been really important to me because I, I have learned kind of the great British public, of which I'm part, has a huge and innate curiosity for new stories and want it. Mm. And I think we, we really struggle with sort of academia and kind of at a commissioning level sometimes with a belief that people only want the same thing. They don't actually want to be challenged. And that's not true. So I've never had a pushback from kind of from the general British public who, who when you kind of, when I do talks and I show these incredible photos of the destruction of the suffragettes, mm. And when I get to work in as a consultant like for suffragettes of Lucy Worsley, which is all my kind of my PhD research, has a huge amount of that went into the development of that program. You know, you, you sort of see people really jump on the excitement. The pushback has been from traditional academics not wanting this story out there because they believe it corrupts our memory <laughs> of the suffragettes, <laughs> when actually it's just the reality. It's the reality of what these women were doing, and we owe it to them to showcase the decisions they made to give us the freedoms we have today. And then that kind of desperately trying to, you know, I've been trying to get a, the documentary like this done for about four years at every channel and it got turned down everywhere because people thought it was too hard. And then the production company who finally made what is a stunning documentary on it came to me when they already had the commission in place because someone else had made that choice. And that's an amazing thing to be part of. I think you, a lot of people I think believe TV is something where you can just kind of march in the door and go, here's my amazing idea. And you know, with a snap of fingers, it's made. It's not often you're knocking on that door for three to four years, telling different people about it, and then someone else will make it. <laughs> and you, you kind of, you have to face a choice of going, do I want to be part of this or not? And when, when Lucy's production company, the people she's working with, told me what they were doing and explained how they wanted to do it, there was no way I could say no because you have, you know, an incredible presenter and the way it's put together where it really takes you into the heart mm. of that history, you know, you, you just have to say, yeah, of course I want to be part of that in any, in any tiny way I can. And I, 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 was, I was really lucky, and I think history on television is, is something we have to do as academics. We have to be part of that world, because it, it just makes programmes better. I mean, when you said some of the channels said it was too hard, yeah. this story, <laughs> hard how? Well, so I, I had one channel come back uh, <laughs> in, in the most kind of insane way where We'd put, we'd sort of we'd put in a pitch uh, probably about a year and a half ago for we want to tell the story of the suffragette bombers, the terror, the mm. terrorism of the suffragettes, and they came back and went, we really want to do this. Yep, yeah, we really want to do this. This wasn't BBC. We really want to do it, uh, but um, what we need is kind of big explosive social history, and uh, uh, and this isn't it. <laughs> <laughs> when you can, when you get that, mm. can you get that kind of note back? You just sort of sit there going. They actually use the word explosive. Yeah. In a documentary about bombers. Yeah, that, well, that it wasn't. That it wasn't. Yeah. And you just sort of sit there going, did you just see the word suffrage and go, oh no, this will be boring. I'm not even going to open the pitch, because you kind of the disconnect between the reality of our history and trying to showcase it and what people think people want to watch. I think sometimes can be really extreme because there's so many exciting things happening in history now, in our research, what we're finding, what we're challenging. But the hardest thing for people like me who, who work in telly as an academic is, is not getting it to the British public, but convincing the person to say <laughs> yes, that, they're, that it's a good idea. And I, th I think that can, for many of us, that can be intensely frustrating because I spend my life talking to people, either in public talks or writing books or writing for press or radio, 
and that is very easy to do and you see kind of the feedback people are so full of questions and and we want we want to know more but often convincing tv which has the biggest audience is the hardest part and i think i think that's changing with digital you know incredible companies are kind of coming to the fore like dan's nose history hit which is really pushing people like me to give us the opportunity to that's a live platform that's it. yeah it is it's so it's it's a kind of it's an amazing digital online platform with history documentaries that they're making themselves so I get to say Dan I've got this amazing thing that I know um, I've got a history here so I've got this amazing bit of knowledge that I know this we make a fantastic documentary the terrestrial channels won't do it because they they might find it too challenging or they might not think it they might find it too controversial they just want to you know redo the Tudors or they want mm. to redo recycle you know are we going to have another documentary on Elizabeth I or Henry VIII and his wives of course we are why can't we just do this amazing thing instead and they're giving people like me the chance to go okay well here's a very small budget here's eight days wow plan it shoot it and we'll put it out and and you're gonna you know you are starting to see really exciting things start to come together in ways that aren't just normal terrestrial TV and, and with this particular story, with suffragettes, I mean, you say about it not being explosive, when it is, yes. uh, clearly. Um, what, was your, what were your feelings towards these women when you started to mm. delve into the actions that they took? How did, yeah. I mean, because they, they I mean, the, st the stats are quite, quite crazy. Was yeah. it, so 168 arson and bomb attacks, I think, and there, was it 56 million pounds worth of damage done in, in, a, in that particular spate of attacks, yeah. which, was, which was in London, they were yeah. going around smashing stuff up and, and things. How did your opinion of them change? Because obviously they, this is, this, they've been you know, asking since the 1860s yep. for change. Nothing had happened. No. This resort to direct action. Yeah, it's the only thing people can do. I, I found it at times intensely uncomfortable because a lot of my research has been kind of on what the bombs are made from. And when you're reading descriptions of bombs that are made from nitroglycerin and gunpowder packed with shrapnel left on time devices on packed commuter trains, for me, having grown up under kind of the threat of terror, you know, I remember the IRA from when I was very young. You didn't go to London at Christmas because the IRA was going to bomb it. And then when I was finishing school, I had friends who got the bus that was blown up on 7-7 every day they didn't on that one because they were too hungover <laughs> um, but you you know i don't think in our modern world especially in england you will know someone whose life has not been touched by the terror that we live on under every day or with that we're dealing mm. with and i certainly had a very emotional reaction when i started kind of really unpicking what it meant mm. and have always found the the reality of it difficult but that doesn't change the fact it's our history and I still find the women and the choices that they made incredible because it was a very different time and they were fighting a, a fight I needed them to to do if they hadn't done it I wouldn't have the rights I have today I wouldn't have my PhD I wouldn't have the opportunity to be able to talk to you as an equal in law in, ev in everything and, and I, I think we have to know the reality of those actions and then it is a personal choice for everyone who sees that and hears about it and can judge for themselves how they feel about it. That's, that's where I came to in the end. I mean, it, it, it feels like an irony that they weren't given the vote or it wasn't discussed because they didn't want to, the parliament didn't want to be seen to be kowtowing to direct action and, and sort of um, sort of folding in front of this sort of uh, campaign. Mm. But then mass conflict opened the door slightly. And yeah. is, 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 is there not some irony in, in a world well, there's, war? There's a massive irony because uh, it's, it's insane what happens in World War I. So the suffragettes are bombing and the arson campaign right up to the outbreak of World War I and then they, they decide to have an armistice to show that they are normal members of society and they will throw their weight behind what the British government wants. But at the same time as World War I is happening, the Russians are having a huge revolution, not only are they involved in the war, where they destroy their society and there's an intense social uprising and they give women the vote for the first time. Emmeline Pankhurst writes to our government and says, 
We need the Russians as allies. Send me as the leader of one revolution to speak to these new leaders of their revolution. I will make, I will make this happen. Guess what happens? Our government says yes, <laughs> and they send her. So they, it's, it's you know this kind of incredible moment where they send the leader of what is one of our biggest domestic terror organizations to go and speak to the Russians because that's the power she now has. And it's very clear kind of in that moment that the threat is there. When this war is over, imagine what will happen if you don't give women the vote. So it's not a case of kind of the direct action is happening and then the first war breaks, out, war breaks out and suddenly women get the vote mm. because we're just deciding that's the fun thing to do. It's very clearly linked to the violence of the suffragettes, to the power Emmeline Pankhurst then has in terms on the world stage because the bill for us to finally begin universal suffrage is in 1917. It's passed in 1918 but it's in that moment when she's there talking to Russia. So you cannot disconnect these things from our history, and yet we have forgotten them entirely. And, and just finally, I, I, I wondered, um, are you and any of your colleagues sort of yeah. lobbying the, educa you know, the, the, the education boards to have these stories included on curriculums? Because it does feel like this is quite a gap. Yeah. There is a gap. In, in our understanding of these stories, and particularly when you mention Kitty, Kitty's story, and you know, a hundred years later, here we are with Me Too, and she's undergone the exact same assaults. I mean, it feels like it's it's something that's needed. Uh, Massively, I have been in a very unusual position in that for my whole career, I have been the only academic historian specialising in terrorist violence of the suffragettes in our country. There's no one else. There's just me. And part of that is because it's been a really controversial subject. Feminist historians haven't really wanted, the traditional ones haven't really wanted to engage with it. And those who are just normal historians who have tried to engage with it have been demonized and hunted in the press and kind of painted as women haters. And, and it's, it's been a very kind of vicious campaign. One I've, I've faced since I've determinedly gone public with this research, but I think now I get a lot of history teachers on Twitter sort of saying, I'm, you know, your book is in our classroom and we are changing it and I'm working very closely with the university to try and make sure we have funding to really push for proper full research that isn't just me, that is a whole group of people. Because mm. there's so many stories here, you know, there's no way I can do this alone. There has to be more people. Um, so I hope, and I think with things like Lucy's documentary, we are going to put the pressure on to make this something that everyone knows about and should know about. So I hope in 10 years time, we are in a very different place. And it certainly feels like we are now that it feels like the knowledge is becoming far more common, which is what it should be. But I, I have my fingers crossed for the future on everything. <laughs>